Uh, so normally I don't text during worship because, you know, we want to focus on Jesus only when a miracle happens. So I was texting Steve Zanaco, the team, as they were coming back this morning. I said, hey, I'm praying for traveling mercies. And right before worship, he said, uh, look, pray specifically for connections. Everything's tight. Brooke and Cole's flight was canceled. They just keep getting hit. And their luggage was delayed um, on the way there to Scotland. And then it says, looks like all connections except two are not going to connect. And I said, well, pray. And I'm praying during worship. And then he texts me back while we were singing about God being a, a, a miracle worker. Uh, he just says, just experienced a miracle. Yes. Door was closed. Our team held on. Lots of exclamation points, friends. <laughs> Stayed together, prayed. They opened the flight back up. What? Praise God. He said, the story is even better. Our people are amazing. And then I, he just said, it's a story. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Jesus. So it is so good to be with you today. Oh, my goodness. I thank you, worship team. <laughs> we just want to keep this party going, focusing on Jesus. You good with that? Yes. Um, wow. Uh, thank you. Just a time to focus, to focus. That's what today is about, to focus. I want to extend a personal welcome. If you are new to Antioch Indy, welcome. Uh, this is a, a family. Uh, Sharon and I have been here about uh, three years, and uh, this is our spiritual family. So if you are looking for a home, I just want to personally extend a welcome. Thank you. And speaking of family, like I said, we're getting 55 of our family back. So keep praying. Would you today just keep praying that they hit every connection, and we can't wait to hear the story. So shout out to you. You guys are probably going to be listening to it. 55 of you coming back from Scotland. We love you, and we can't wait to hear the stories. All right, so this month, uh, we're focusing on four different books in the New Testament. And uh, last week, Sam, thank you, Sam, for kicking us off in Ephesians, my favorite uh, book in the New Testament. Thanks, Sam, for taking my favorite book. Uh, but dude, you, you killed it, and, I, and thank you for leading us in that. And today, uh, we're going to dive into another favorite, okay? Um, I have another favorite, and it's Colossians. And Colossians is all about Jesus. It'd be like a series called Only Jesus that Steve did. This is like part six of that. Sam did part five. I just, we're going to keep it going because the theme of the New Testament, yeah, it's about Jesus, okay? It's going to burst your bubble. It's about Jesus. Um, I am going to prepare you, though. I'm going to be sharing a lot of information, okay, this morning, providing context for this letter. So more importantly, I pray that while you're getting this information, that there's transformation going on, okay, that the Holy Spirit uh, is doing the work inside you. Sometimes you're going to wonder, where in the world is he going with this? Hang in there. Are we good? You're going to hang in there and allow the Holy Spirit to, to say what he wants you to hear, okay? So I want to start with a prayer. Um, and actually this morning, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to pray this. It comes out of Colossians. So in that spirit, would you close your eyes and pray with me? And these are echoing the words of Paul that he prayed for the Colossian church. And it's a prayer for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you give us complete knowledge of your will. We pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding. We ask that you would help us to live in a way that will always honor and please you, and that our lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Father, we pray that we would grow to know you better and better, that we are strengthened in all of your glorious power so that we will have all the endurance and patience we need. <laughs> May we be filled with joy, always thanking you, Father, you have enabled us to share in your inheritance that belongs to your people who live in the light. For you have rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Whew. I could just stop right there. Uh, so we are going to get a little relevant background to this letter, and it is a letter. So the epistles, if you wonder, that's kind of a churchy term. Just It means letter, and, and these are letters that were written to churches. And this one, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to Colossians from prison in Rome about 60 AD when Nero was emperor of the Roman Empire. Nero, that may have come to you if you studied any history. This dude was bad. 
He became emperor when he was 16 years old, and he um, was emperor until he was 30 when he took his life. But in that time, he did a lot of damage. Um, like four other emperors before him, Nero was considered by the Romans to be divine, a god emperor, with supreme and ultimate authority. And because he had this ultimate authority, he did as he pleased. Nothing was off limits for this man, and no one would stand in his way. I mean, not only did he have his stepbrother, mother, and wife murdered, he was absolutely ruthless toward Christians through outright discrimination, torture, mass execution, and unspeakable atrocities. Dude was bad. Okay. And it was in this pagan and violent context that Paul wrote this letter from a prison again in Rome to the church in Colossae. Can you imagine penning this note from prison? So Colossae, it was a, it's a vibrant city in the Roman Empire built on a major trade route in the province of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Uh, they're gonna show a map. Uh, I'm a big fan of maps, ask Sharon. Gotta, gotta have my maps. So Colossae um, was known throughout the region for making this beautiful, dark, red wool cloth called Colossinum. Hmm, that sounds kind of familiar. That's right, it sounds a lot like their city, Colossae, Colossinum, Colossae. Now, Paul didn't plant the church in Colossae. Uh, it was certainly impacted, though, by his missionary efforts in Asia Minor. He spent three years in Ephesus, which is about 100 miles away, okay? And he planted a church uh, there in Colossae, and then he equipped others for sending the gospel to other regions of the world. Even today, that's still happening today, right? Mexico, Scotland, God is still at work around the world today. Yes. So based on Colossians 1.7, uh, it's likely that a missionary from uh, that Paul equipped in Ephesus, a guy named Epaphras, planted the Colossian church. This is uh, Colossians 1.7 and 8. He said, you learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved coworker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he's helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So Paul, he wrote this letter to encourage the church, pray for them. If you, if you spend time in Colossians this week, you're just gonna see Paul's love for the church. And he also wrote to them to correct a lot of false teaching and confusion that was happening, all this religious rituals. See, Colossae, like a lot of the churches in that region, they fused many religions together. Uh, here's, a, here's a term for you kids today. It's called syncretism. Syncretism. And syncretism is this blending of religions, okay? And so they had Jewish traditions, practices, Greek philosophy, pagan influences, and they kind of all stirred it up together. Now, one syncretic practice, get this, was the worship of angels, okay? So many in Colossae worshipped the archangel Michael, which you go, oh, yeah, we know Michael. Well, they believed that Michael uh, opened a fissure in the earth and then flowing water spilled out from it and it had healing powers, kind of like the pool of Siloam. And so a lot of people came and people were like, oh, wow, we got we to gotta worship Michael. Well, they were close. Yes, he's an angel, but don't worship him, right? So Paul's dealing with that. And, and all the, again, all these other influences are, are going on. Now, before we think, oh, that was then, that was then, folks, <laughs> it happens today. There is syncretism happening all over, and we're getting really good at it in America. We've made it very individualistic. So I have my own, I wouldn't call it syncretism, I have my own brand of religion, my own spirituality. You hear this all the time. People create a spiritual playlist. Now, I know we don't have them anymore, but we used to have iPods, okay? And used to, I thought, wow, this is cool. I can create a playlist. We can still create playlists, and we do that spiritually. And sometimes we're not even sure that we're doing it. And this is what happened. This infiltrates into the church. So you with me? Like this is relevant for us today. Okay. So Paul's letters, he begins with personal introductions, concludes it with personal remarks. It's amazing. Don't skip over that stuff. When you get a chance this week, read through the people that he served with, that he encouraged. And when you read Colossians on your own, you'll see how much this man who in his earlier life he, he approved the killing of Christians, okay? When he was saved by grace, he had a personal encounter with Jesus. He loved the church, and he loved those who led it. 
Okay, so how do you break Colossians down? Four chapters, first two chapters, focuses on the theology of Jesus, knowing about Jesus. And this is very common. If you look at a lot of Paul's letters, he'll speak to correct theology, and then he'll get into practice. So in the theology of Jesus, he's really correcting this wrong teaching that has deceived and confused these young believers. And then chapters 3 and 4 really focuses on the practice or the submission. You heard that this morning about submission. The submission to Jesus representing a new way of life. So here's how I'd sum up the big ideas from Colossians. Chapters 1 and 2, center your mind on Jesus, the supreme one above all things. I was diagnosed with ADD at 35. I had it my whole life, didn't know it was a thing. I get really distracted by shiny things and many things, okay? And what I love about Colossians is he's focusing. And we do this too, spiritually. We can get spiritual ADD. We can go, oh, there's all these good things out here. Today, Paul's saying, focus, center your mind on Jesus, the supreme one above all things, the supreme one above all things. And chapters three and four, center your life on Jesus, the one priority above all things. So in this message, I pray that the Holy Spirit recenters our minds on him who is supreme above all things and that we recenter our lives on Jesus, the one priority above all things. So with that introduction, go ahead and stand. And we are going to read the passage together, but you can put your Bibles down because we're going to read it on the screen. I want us to literally read this passage. It's the passage you meditated on in our Selah time. And we're going to read it together in unison with vigor, okay? This is the Word of God, folks. All right, you ready? All right, together. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anyone else and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and lead through him. God reconciled everything to himself he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Amen. You may be seated. Whew, there's power in the people reading God's word together. As you may have noticed, the word supreme shows up twice in this passage, supreme. The Greek word for supreme is kurios, which means a supreme in authority, controller by implication, master, as a respectful title, God, Lord, Master. So in the Roman Empire, people would have said to Nero, Curios, okay? Supreme in the English language stays in that vein. It means highest ranking, power, or authority, like the Supreme Court. It also means the highest degree in quality, like Supreme Gasoline. By the way, does anybody use Supreme Gasoline? Because what in the world, right? I don't get that. Maybe your car, you say, you got to use Supreme. I don't get that. Uh, lastly, it means the most extreme or great, like these Supremes. Come on, the Supremes. The Motown female trio, right, who lived up to their name with timeless classes like Stop in the Name of Love, You Can't Hurry Love, and Someday We'll Be Together. The Supremes. Check it out on iTunes, kids. You're going to love them. Supreme synonyms. Highest ranking, highest, leading, chief, head, top, foremost, principal, superior, premier, first, cardinal, prime, sovereign, directing, governing, greatest, dominant, overriding, predominant, prevailing, preeminent. That's my favorite one, preeminent. Supreme, or as in the Urban Dictionary, supreme is the bomb diggity. The coolest, biggest, greatest, most epic in the world. By the way, does anybody say bomb diggity anymore? 
didn't think so, okay? You get the picture. The highest, the ultimate, the first. So let's start with the overall theme of chapters one and two. Center your mind on Jesus, the supreme one above all things. Paul makes a big deal about Christ's supremacy to counter the pagan worship of many gods, to put in perspective the earthly rulers like the emperor, and to counter false teaching that was spread throughout the Colossian church. He says this in uh, chapter 2. Paul says, I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Don't don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. So, So much of this false teaching what Paul calls empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense was centered around, here's another big term today, Gnosticism. Gnosticism. These folks thought they were all that. Right. They, they, they had special knowledge. They had a special knowing. And they kind of taught that way. Like, we, we've got it all figured out. Gnosticism taught many things, but one of the main teachings they had was that all things of earth or matter are evil. Okay? And only the things of pure spirit are good. So, matter bad, pure spirit good. Um, and there were several forms of Gnosticism, and they all shared this belief, again, of this, the, this break, breakout of matter from spirit, body, and soul. And one form taught that the way to overcome evil was through extreme self denial and severe treatment of the body because of the belief that. Again, anything regarding the body was evil. So Paul addresses the Gnostics, the Jewish practices, and even the angel worshipers by warning them. And again, these were Jewish practices that they got confused, that they didn't need anymore. And he addresses this in chapter 2. So check out this in chapter 2, starting in verse 16. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy days, or, or new moon ceremonies, or Sabbaths. For these are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Look, don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying that they've had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You, you've died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of this world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires, okay? Paul's like, hey, don't let anybody condemn you. Like, don't don't be all judgy, right? Two times in this passage related to religious rituals or rules that have nothing to do with the gospel, nothing to do with conquering evil. Jesus alone, the one who is the supreme creator, who died on the cross to cover all sin, he alone saves. He alone conquers sin and evil. Amen? Right? Let's not add anything to the work of the cross. And this is where we can get into trouble even today. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be, have our, our radar up to not be deceived by teachings or anything that impedes this work of Christ. So there's some other forms of Gnosticism. These get a little crazy, okay? One was the belief that Jesus never came in human form. He was just some ghost or some angelic spirit. They believed that Jesus did not come to the earth as a real person, with a real body, die a real death, and have a real bodily resurrection. So this is one of the teachings that was going on. And you can see how that teaching would really confuse people and the believers that Jesus, we believe, right, 100% God, 100% man. And they're just like, no, 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 he's, he's just... Just a body, not, or just a spirit. 
So Paul, Paul confronts this false teaching by reinforcing the bodily nature uh, when he says this in, in Colossians 1.22. He says, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. He wants to make it really short. He died, he, he lived here, physical body. And as a result, he's brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. The full work of Christ, friends, would not have been complete without Christ's physical body, broken and bleeding on our behalf. Otherwise, our sins would not have been taken away. And yet another form of Gnosticism is even crazier, okay? They believe that Jesus' deity was temporary, so hang with me, so that when uh, he got his godness was after the, at, the, at the baptism, and then he did all these miracles, and then right before he goes to the cross, it's taken away, and now just a man dies on the cross. Well, you can see that's a problem, too, because now we've got what, what happened to the atoning work of the cross for all, all mankind, right? That, that was bad teaching, too. So statements like these from Paul counter this kind of deceitful teaching with truth about Jesus' reconciling work on the cross. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For God, in all his fullness, here it is, was pleased to live in Christ, 100% man, 100% God. And through, God, through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. We good? Are we ha you hanging with, hang with me on this? Why this is so relevant? With all this nonsense that's infiltrating the church, you can see why Paul had to correct this teaching and centering their minds on the supremacy of Christ. So let's go back to our primary text, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. And now for the third time this morning, let the word recenter you on the truth of Christ's supremacy. And as I slowly read it, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I want to invite the Holy Spirit's work, okay, to highlight a word or phrase that you need to hear this morning about Christ. You ready? Okay, close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to highlight a word or phrase. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. You can open your eyes. Go ahead and write down that word or phrase that stood out to you. What was it? What was the Holy Spirit took that spiritual highlight and said, pay attention to this. Later today or tomorrow, within the next 24 hours, continue to meditate on this passage and pray into that word or phrase. He has more for you in that. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He existed before anything. He created everything. He has authority over everything. He holds all creation together. He's the head of the church. He's first in everything. He reconciled everything. He made peace with everything. Paul declares without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is supreme. Would you repeat that with me? Jesus is supreme. Do you believe this? Do we believe this? Because if we do, we must center our lives on him. The one priority above all things. 
chapters 3 and 4, center your life on Jesus, the one priority above all things. This word priority, and I can't say it very well, priority, it's derived from the Latin word prioritas, which means first in rank, order, or dignity. First in rank, order, or dignity. And you can see the connection to supreme, right? Greg McGowan uh, wrote a book called Essentialism, a book I highly recommend. Uh, he made this fascinating observation about the word priority. And it's, it's kind of a business book, but I love the focus here. He says uh, in his book, the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. It was singular. It meant the very first or prior thing. It stayed singular for the next 500 years. And only in the 1900s did we pluralize the term and start talking about priorities. Illogically, we reasoned that by changing the world, changing the word, we could bend reality. Today, we talk about priorities all the time, whether they're priorities about work, at home, about our health, spiritually. I mean, it can be maddening to know what are my priorities, right? Balance, balance, priorities. How do we do this? The truth is, friends, and I can speak this because I've wrestled with this my whole life, if everything's a priority, then nothing is, right. okay? It's about 30 years ago when we still lived in Pennsylvania. Shout out to Pennsylvania, okay? Right. I went to my first men's retreat. I was uh, new in my faith journey, new in my business career, new in my marriage, newly serving our church with every ministry known to man because I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> and I was anticipating being a new dad. Shout out to my lovely wife, three great children. After one of the talks, I pulled this pastor aside. I'm like, look, uh, I need to get some wisdom in getting this whole priorities thing straight. Uh, so, like, what's the list here? God, wife, parenting, work. God, work, wife, parenting. What about when do I work out? I don't know this. I'm freaking out. And him, you know, is there some other combination? And you guys, you know what I'm talking about, right? Pie charts, right? Balance. Okay, how, how am I going to make this work? How do we get the priorities right? And the pastor just smiled at me. He's about... 20, 30 years older than me, and he just said, Jesus is the list. Yes. I must have looked like a confused dog, you know? Because <laughs> yeah. that was not the answer I was looking for. Right. You know, the head turn. Yeah. Jesus is the list. <laughs> what? <laughs> Jesus is, is the list? Yeah, he said, Jesus is the list. Okay, I got some work to do. So as I look back on that encounter, he, what he was trying to tell me is that Jesus is the priority. He's the one thing. He's the priority in your marriage. He's the priority in your job. He's the priority in all your relationships and your family. He's the priority in everything. He's the priority. The psalmist says it this way in the message. I love this. He says, my choice is you, God, first and only and now I find I'm your choice. My choice is you, God, first and only. And now I find I'm your choice. And Jesus, of course, says this in Matthew, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. I'm the list, Jesus is saying. <laughs> Just come to me. He's the list. He's the priority. So remember our definition of priority, first in rank, order, or dignity. So centering our lives around Jesus, who's first in rank, order, and dignity, it affects how we think and how we live. So turn to Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of this earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. Paul's saying, get the focus straight. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Think about these things. 
not the things of this earth. Christ is your life. Centering your life on Jesus, the one priority begins with centering our thoughts on what matters most. Sending your thoughts on what matters most. So years ago, Sharon and I read through an amazing book called Switch on Your Brain by Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's a South African cognitive neuroscientist, and she's a passionate Christ follower. She's dedicated her life to link the science of neuroplasticity, another big word for you kids today, <laughs> the ability of the brain to form and reorganize synaptic connections. So she's linked this science of neuroplasticity with God's promises of renewing our minds. It's wild. Simply put, Dr. Leaf and other cognitive neuroscientists have proven that mind controls matter. Our thoughts have regency over our bodies. There's not this, there's not this huge distinction like the Gnostics were saying. It's all connected. And the, you know, the shalom, the Jewish idea of shalom, it's, it's all connected, okay? So it's just reinforcing this. She says this in her book. Thoughts are real, physical things that occupy mental real estate. Moment by moment, every day, you are changing the structure of your brains through your thinking. I mean, if you look at photographs of your, um, uh, your brain cells, they're like, they look like trees. And the more that you are thinking about the one thing, the thicker that tree gets. And think about lies, thoughts that the enemy's planted and you've believed your whole life, they're pretty thick. So there's work to be done. And many of our thoughts are toxic. They're toxic, she says. They're actually killing us. Our thoughts are killing us. A few of the stats she cites in her book, this is crazy, but true. The American Medical Association has found that stress is a factor in 75% of all illnesses and diseases that people suffer from today. And that, that's before COVID, <laughs> right? And then another uh, neuroscientist guy named, he's a biologist, a believer, Dr. Bruce Linton, a scientist who's made great strides in understanding the effects of our thinking on our brain. This stat, when I first read it, I couldn't believe it. He says a staggering 98% of all diseases are related to lifestyle choices. In other words, our thinking. So think about the big ones, heart disease, cancer, respiratory diseases, diabetes, 98% are ultimately related to toxic thoughts. And, th and those, aren't, those thoughts aren't just killing ourselves, they're killing our relationships. Toxic thoughts lead to toxic behavior. Back to Colossians 3, starting in verse 8. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. And this is toxic behavior. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Put to death your old nature with all that those toxic thoughts and put on your new nature. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and be like him. Put off, put on. Colossians 3, 12, one, 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. I love that image. Clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. See the opposite? Okay. Put off the old nature, put on the new nature. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Just being honest, anybody have had grievances with other people? Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. I have. Somebody's had it. Right? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love. I love that image. It's like a cloak. The scripture talks about the cloak of righteousness. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Clothe yourselves with the fruit of the Spirit. Forgive one another. Put on love. So how do we do this? How do we put off this old nature and put on the new one? And worship team, if you want to come up, this will be a good time. First, if you've never given your life to Christ... That's the place to start. 
Um, we'd love you to be taking communion with us next week. More importantly than that, we'd love you to have this new life in Christ, and you'll have that opportunity at the end of the service. And for those of us who have received Christ as Lord and Savior, Paul offers some commentary from the other letters in the New Testament. How do we do this? He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. He's saying this in Romans 12, 2. But let God transform the way you think into a new person by changing, excuse, excuse me, let him transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Renewing of your mind. He's, God can change the way you think. And then uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5. And I highly recommend memorizing both of these. Um, I've, I've leveraged these verses over years. This one, uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5. We demolish arguments and every peak pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. We take thought, we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. I, I get this picture when I get a thought that comes in and it's like, it's trying to get, <laughs> it's trying to get to me. And it's like, I, I, I give it, this is my mental picture. I put it into like a steel ball and I say, that's not my thought. And I give it to Jesus. And you know what he does? He just chucks it into the pit of hell. Isn't that good? Take that thought captive and make it a being of grace. That's not my thought. I don't want to hold on to that. It's not mine. Here, Jesus, you take it. Whatever it works for you, come up with your model and throw it in the pit of hell where it belongs. Let God transform you by changing the way you think. Take every thought captive by making it obedient to Christ. And when we center our minds on Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, because we can't do this on our own, friends, it's too hard. He will help us bring in alignment, our hearts and our actions. Sam shared last week three simple and powerful ways to put this into practice. It's not rocket science. Read God's word. Pray to him. Engage with others in community. Why do we have to hear about this every week? Pray. Read God's word. Can you give us some new material? Well... It's a daily practice. Every day, I need to be in his word. It's my daily bread. Okay? Not because I have to, because I need to. I can't survive otherwise. Pray to him, have a conversation with him, talk to him, listen to him, and engage with others in community because it's too hard to go it alone. And to build on what Sam said, I want to offer you an approach that you can practice both on your own and in community. Sometimes we need some tools to help us. You may have heard it before in practice. It's called Lectio Divina. Ron's throwing all these big terms to us today. Lectio Divina. It's okay. It means Latin for sacred reading. Sacred reading. Lectio Divina is a traditional monastic practice of Bible reading, meditation, and prayer intended to promote knowing God, not just knowing about God. Do you want to know God? You know, I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. So Lecta Divina is a, it's a way that we read the Bible about transformation, not just information. Now, I don't take anything away from studying God's word. I had to study God's word for today, right? We need to still study the word, but we also need to allow God to study us, to engage in us. It's a way to meditate on God's word that renews your mind and your heart. It fuses the reading of word in prayer because God's word is, is living and active, right? And just look at this as a whole process. The heart of Lectio Divina is to meditate on a short passage of Scripture slowly and prayerfully several times, inviting God to speak to you in the process. It's like you're standing at the edge of the ocean and you just let the waves roll past you. And just let the Word, the Scripture, come over you and, and, and receive it Sometimes it will knock you down on your rear end, <laughs> right? That way may come. Uh, it'll knock you on your rear end, but um, read it over and over. Lectio Divina um, is just a simple practice. We practice it today in our service, right? We first quietly meditated on Colossians 1, 15 to 20 at the beginning of our service. Then we stood up and we read it together um, in unison. And then I read it to you again and I had you focus on a word or phrase. 
you can take this a step further with the one word or phrase that stood out to you. Like I said, what does he want you to do with this? How does he want you to rethink or, or is there an action he wants you to take? There's no right or wrong way to practice this. It's an approach and I've used it for years. I'll just review it again. Prepare your heart in silence when you're doing this. Breathe slowly. Read the scripture slowly, thoughtfully. Be in a good posture. If you're not in a good posture, this isn't going to work. Don't rush it. And then pause, read it again. Read that passage again. Ask the Holy Spirit to highlight a word or phrase like we did to you today. And then the third time, ask the Holy Spirit again, what would he, how would you have you respond? And that could be a prayer back to him going, this stood out to me. I'm not sure I know what to do with this. Okay, now you've got a conversation going. All right? If you need a place to start, I highly recommend to engage um, with an app called Lectio 365. So Blair, uh, who's with, uh, shout out to Blair in uh, Fort Collins, Antioch, Fort Collins. She stayed at our house. And, and a few months ago, she and Sharon were talking about prayer, and she talked about this app. And we've been using this app for, what, four or five months, honey? Uh, there are two devotionals, one in the morning and one in the evening. There's even a family version, so uh, you can do this with your kids. Um, What's beautiful about this is it gives you an opportunity to practice meditating on the word. And then the, the one for the evening, if you, any of you have trouble sleeping, your brain is like spinning. The one for evening, we, we constantly fall asleep to it, but that's okay. We're getting laid into the arms of Jesus at night, you know? So if you, I highly recommend that app. And it's an amazing global ministry, too. Uh, this week, we're praying for missionaries all over the world. And by the way, we have missionaries here from Thailand. Can you guys raise your hands yeah. over here? Yeah. Thanks for getting it done, Thailand. So we're part of a global movement, and Lectio 365 is, is a wonderful ministry. So uh, also, if you need a little extra help, uh, every Wednesday, the sanctuary, this, this room is open from 11 to 1. And uh, there's a time for you to just engage in prayer. And guess what it's called? Lectio Divina. So you get to do that. So as we close our time together this morning, let's live out those big ideas gleaned from Colossians. Center your mind on Jesus, the supreme one above all things. Center your life on him, the one priority above all things. When it's Thursday and you go, what was it about? Supreme priority supreme priority focus on him during our last worship song our prayer team will be up in front with me i'd encourage you to come up for prayer for whatever you need maybe there's this toxic thought you've had and you can't get rid of it it's like man that thing has occupied major space in my head come up for prayer we'll pray the truth around that and break that uh maybe you need healing maybe there's something there again it's it's something physical but it could be tied to something else come up for healing or maybe you just need a word of encouragement. So come up for prayer. Friends, so good to be with you. Let's worship, continue in worship with the Supreme One, Jesus, who's given us all, and he's the one priority in our life.